Okay. All right. Bye. See you later. <coughs> All right, guys. It's five o'clock Tuesday night. Time for the filter. Uh, I thought we were gonna get rained out. We uh, we almost lost our power. Power came on about five minutes ago, and uh, yeah, we lead we lead a charmed life here. I had no doubt that everything was gonna gonna go off without a hitch. Um, we've got a very good show tonight, uh, Tuesday, November tenth, twenty fifteen. Riding on the coattails is the name of tonight's uh, episode. Um, we are going to go through the price of not only Bitcoin, but some of the altcoins and see about this latest spike in price and what it has, uh, how it has affected uh, the other coins. Is there a relationship? Is there something going on? Is there some strange cabal making a lot of money in altcoins speculating on the, uh, the ups and downs of Bitcoin or not? We shall see. We're going to go through a little bit of uh, local news. Um, we've got a few really cool articles that were posted by people in the group that, that I will highlight, including one uh, from you, Deborah, about uh, economics being on trial. That's a good one. Um, we've got the Fed maybe raising rates, maybe not, based on some jobs numbers. Um, and uh, we're going to talk about the Bitcoin bounty hunter. How exciting is that? Bitcoin bounty hunter. Okay, so stay tuned. Let's get started. I'll kick things off here by sharing my screen. Just a moment here, guys. All right. All right. Now, all the lovely folks at home are no longer looking at my uh, sweaty forehead. They're, they can now see the, the <laughs> yes, they can see with the screen that we're looking at up in front of the room here. So, all right, there's the uh, event. And I pulled it up this way just so you guys could know that when I say that I'm posting things in the show notes, I'm posting things in the comments of the, of the event page. So, um, Afterward, I go through and I take all the links that we talked about, and if there anything else pops up, then I post it here in the on the event page. So you can, you should be able to go here after the fact and find all the links to the stuff that we talk about um, in the event page. So check that out. Um, of course, we coordinate all of our efforts on this Bitcoins in Bali Facebook group, uh, and uh, the events tab is where you'll find all the. Um, the current and past events that we've done, along with all the links that go along with them. And the way this works is uh, people post their stories on the page here. We discuss it online. And then when we get together in person, we talk about it in person. And then you'll see some of the, some of the articles that were posted here we'll end up talking about uh, tonight even. So that's how it works. If you find good stuff about Bitcoin, get in there to the Bitcoins in Bali group and post something. We've also got our YouTube channel, and uh, these things, as soon as we're done with these meetings, they go right up on YouTube. So warts and all, it's right up there uh, directly after these meetings. So you can go and check it out uh, after the fact. But uh, give us a um, give give this a look when you get a chance, and uh, maybe subscribe. You can see there's there's other things that go on besides um, just the episodes. Um, Every once in a while, I'll post other other things to the channel. So uh, give it a subscription, and uh, you can keep keep abreast of everything we've got going on uh, video wise. We've also got a conversation here on Twitter using the hashtag Bitcoins in Bali. Johnny Freesh. <laughs> he's he's participating from beyond. <laughs> Yes, yes, he's <laughs> taken Melbourne by storm. Yes, we miss you, Johnny. Of course, we are coming to you live from the amazing co working space Hubud, which uh, stands for the hub in Ubud. They are nice enough to allow us to use this lovely uh, Kush cold conference room every week on Tuesday nights. And of course, if you find yourself in Bali, I hope you'll come track us down 
Um, you can, we're, we're in downtown Ubud across from the Monkey Forest, and you can go to hubud.org to, to um, get the details on the venue. Um, speaking of Ubud, coming up, uh, is that next weekend or the weekend after? Two weekends from now, we've got Startup Weekend Bali, uh, where um, on, on, on the first hour, you have no idea what you're doing, and 54 hours later, you have everything you need for a, a startup, angel-funded, uh, get-rich uh, business idea. So I am, I'm going to be at Startup Weekend, and I'm pushing for at least one Bitcoin project. If you have any Bitcoin project ideas, please collaborate with me. Let's, uh, let's um, conspire to get a Bitcoin project in the mix on the 20th at Startup Weekend. I don't know if there's any tickets left. They might be sold out. Um, but if you want to participate, um, come see me after the, after the meeting tonight, and we'll see what we can do. Also, on Saturday, we've got Bitcoin 101. Uh, 10 a.m. this Saturday, we'll spend about three hours. We'll go from knowing absolutely nothing about Bitcoin to actually owning some Bitcoin, having uh, some on your phone and on your laptop, uh, having the ability to store it safely and spend it. The idea here is, um, you know, we're working on building a Bitcoin economy here in Ubud, and we want people to have the ability to walk around with Bitcoin on their phone and go to places like uh, the Viceroy or Kismet. Um, you know, you can rent a scooter in, in Bali using Bitcoin. So we're trying to get the wheels of a Bitcoin economy rolling, and Bitcoin 101 plays a, a role in that. If you know anybody that's shown any interest at all, send them our way. We've still got a few seats left. We will meet in this room uh, this Saturday at 10 a.m., so check that out. Oh, and by the way, uh, please do let us know if, you, if you're coming uh, by hitting this registration link at bitcoinsinbali.org slash bitcoin101. All right, with that, let's turn it over to Rick, talk about the numbers and the price. Take it away, Rick. Thanks, Gary. Wild ride this week. Right now, as we sit here on the Indonesian exchange, we're just a little over $5 million per Bitcoin. As you know, it's quite a bit of an escalation from where we were the last time we spoke. Uh, the volume down under 2,000 Bitcoins again at this point. But at one point during this last week, they exceeded 3,000 Bitcoins in a 24-hour period. That's a biggie considering that they had never exceeded 2,000 just a few days before that. So a uh, big upswing in activity. Uh, unfortunately, there doesn't seem to be any stats on what are the largest trades that are happening on this exchange. I'd be interested to see if, if there was an increasing number of small traders, right, indicating widespread adoption, or if we had a couple of, uh, you know, um, big dogs come in and uh, jump in and speculate wildly. I was looking at, um, I, I should have bookmarked the site for you guys. Just FYI, this is a bit of a bunny trail, but we'll get right back to it. There's been quite an increase in uh, the number of high-quality charting resources that are out there for all coins and digital currencies in general right now. If you uh, go out and just kick the tires a bit, you'll see there's some very interesting stuff that's out there that wasn't there 12 months ago, much less than that. Some of it wasn't even there six months ago. One of the sites that I was looking at tracks for each of the coins what was the largest transaction to take place in the last 24 hours. Uh, and with Bitcoin, for example, there had been a $20 million trans oh, a $10 million transaction take place in the last 24 hours. And with Litecoin, there had actually been a $2 million transaction take place in the last 24 hours. What was interesting about that was that one transaction accounted for more than 50% of the 24-hour volume on Litecoin. Now, so you got to wonder, what's that all about, right? Is that somebody trying to game the Litecoin market? What exchange is that for? Don't know that. Don't know that. Anyway, there's a lot of good charting resources out there, and, and you'll see something pulled from one of those charting resources today. Let's look at U.S. dollars. We're sitting at 380.06 at this moment. The chart down on the bottom left shows us the 24-hour movement. Can you flip over and give us a one-week view, Gary? This is a different chart than we're used to looking at. I'm not sure where the one-week switch is. Mm. Is there a one-week switch? <laughs> no, but I know we were we were up over. We almost hit. Five hundred dollars in the past. Well, week, it depends. Yeah, it depends on which exchange you're looking at. If you look at, uh, uh, I believe it's Bitstamp that I usually track. Bitstamp maxed at four ninety nine. Yeah, Bitstamp. They maxed four ninety nine. Showed only actually got down to about up to about four seventy. 
But hey, we really tested the $500 price point. There's no doubt about that. After that, there was a huge, huge swing in uh, sell volume. And uh, ever since then, which was uh, November 4th, uh, we've been playing this little game of stabilization, bobbing around right around uh, the 380 level seems to be the current support level that we're at. Yeah, right there, Gary, what did they show that number at? That's the coin desk number at 482. Yeah, I, I, was, I was watching Bitstamp, and Bitstamp actually pushed it to 499. So as you know, there's, there's a fair amount of variance depending on which exchange you watch. Um, if you look on the right-hand side of the historical Bitcoin price, the little uh, chart on the right in the gray, yeah. uh, you can see that we've actually had one, two, three down days in total out of the last day. So still quite a bit of strength, right? Remember the last time we were here, we were at that 10.54% day. Uh, so yeah, we've had three total down days. We've had some big selling volume, but uh, actually quite a bit of resiliency in the market. It's been good to see. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let's look at the network data. Oh, is that, uh, yeah, there we go. Uh, what are we looking at for a block reward right now? Uh, over $9,000 solidly, 9427 Of course, when we had those higher price points earlier in the week, that meant blocks were now worth 10 grand a whack, easy. All of a sudden, mining starts getting really interesting again. Market cap, a little over $5.5 billion at this point in time. Uh, I think our M1 rank right now is, survey says, number 97 in the world. Number 97 in the world. So holding in there in the top 100. Um, average block times seen at nine minutes. We've had quite a bit of mining power come online, but uh, no real big swings. There has been a swing in transaction volume, and you'll see. Uh, the time taken to mine the last block, which is down two lines, was actually over 16, almost 17 minutes. Uh, is that the next chart, Gary? Uh, the, I'm sorry? The, the, the transactions. Oh, yeah. There you go. Daily number of transactions. And check out those spikes Ooh. over on, yeah, exactly. Uh, that's been real fun for the miners. <laughs> There's been a lot of money to be made, but uh, it's also put a bit of a strain on things. But hey, it's good. You know, those guys are working hard. They've invested a lot in their hardware. Let's 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 let them make some money. We love that. Notice, if you will, the uh, the the volume numbers as well. Overall, just a consistent trend upwards. Uh, I haven't laid any 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 trend lines on top of this, but I mean, the trend's so obvious. I don't think we need to. <laughs> There is. <laughs> One thing that's interesting about this is, um, you know, this this was the last stress test, I believe, this spike right here, where they tried to flood the network with Bitcoin transactions, right. and there was, um, you know, the, the blocks were full, and sometimes it took two or three 10-minute uh, confirmation periods for different versions of the blockchain to sync up, which means that, you know, if you went to Kismet and you paid for your meal, it it might not show up for an hour or two. So this is this is the scalability question that Bitcoin is dealing with at the moment. And it's interesting to see just how how high we're going based on, I assume this is because there's the, the price has gone up and there's more activity on the blockchain. But we're approaching these levels where they were doing the, yeah, the stress getting, test. Yeah. Right, and I'm not aware of any stress test that's taking place right now. Now, do you know, did we include the, the page on the, um the block debate? Oh, no, I can, can pull that up. That. Can you know what that is real quick? Let's yeah. take a look at that. I haven't looked at this this week either, so I don't uh, I don't know if there's any shift. We've had all this volume coming through. So, survey says, BIP 100 is in the 59%, almost, yeah, and the 8 megabyte is 9.68. That's over 24 hours, right? Yeah. What's the one week? I don't think there's been, yeah, a little bit of trend, not much. Again, we're getting no resolution on this debate, and here we are moving towards the middle of November. Yeah, they, they uh, when they first did the, the projections, they thought uh, fall of 2016 was when we'd really feel the pinch, but it seems like we're feeling the pinch already. So... Okay, let's go back into our sequence if we could. Volatility. I guess no one should be surprised to see that number is way up after what happened across this last week with that spike up to that run up to almost 500 and a retrenchment all the way back down to uh, the 360s. Uh, actually went a, bit of, a little bit lower than that at one point. 
So yeah, big volatility numbers. It's going to take a while for that to level off again. But it was nice to see a, a real change there. We've been looking at such low numbers for a while. I think everybody's starting to wonder if that thing ever moved. Yeah, it moves. Okay, so the theme this week was riding the coattails. Let me explain to you what happened here. Yeah, this is a good try, a good slide to start with. Basically, Gary and I were having a chat, and we're like, wow, so all this is happening with Bitcoin right now. So the question is, is are there other altcoins that are benefiting from this and riding on the coattails of Bitcoin? So I sort of went into the research under the assumption that there were going to be a number of, a number of other altcoins that demonstrated a buy-sell pattern that was similar to Bitcoin with, you know, percentage changes that were analogous, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I'll show you what I found in a second, but just as a refresher, take a look at here are the top 10. Can we see the top 10, Gary? There, there are the top 10 right now by market cap, okay? Uh, and you can see what their 24-hour uh, turnover is in the next to last column of numbers. Uh, the only people that are doing the real numbers in 24-hour turnover are Bitcoin, Litecoin, and Ethereum. They're the only ones over a million dollars in a 24-hour period. So just take a look at that little refresher, and then we're going to look at some charts just to compare things. First thing I did was let's look at the last seven days when we had this big spike of activity. And there's that top 10 list. And you can see that over the last seven days, Bitcoin, despite all the ups and downs, is actually still up 2.97%. I just pulled these charts a couple of hours ago. The only other ones that are up over the last seven days are Dash and Peercoin. And if you look at Dash, you'll see that the Dash chart bears absolutely no resemblance at all to the Bitcoin chart, right? Uh, the Peercoin chart, yeah, there is some similarities there, okay? So I'll go with that. The Litecoin chart, there's a bit of a similarity there. Uh, the Ripple chart, or as they call them, Ripples, uh, has some similarity in shape, but the reality is if you line it up vertically, the Ripple spike was occurring beforehand. All we've actually seen is a fall off there. But there's no other similarity in the shapes of any of these curves, much less the 24-hour change numbers. Now let's go to the 30-day change numbers. Okay, Bitcoin at the top. Now take a look at Ripple. You'll see really no similarity at all. Stellar off on another world. Litecoin, <laughs> some similarity. Ethereum, some similarity. But again, line it up vertically. The spike in Ethereum occurred before the spike in Bitcoin. And I'll explain that in just a second because I dug into that a little bit more. In terms of the numbers, Bitcoin across 30 days is up 56%. Ethereum up 57.71%. And that's what made me take a little bit of a deeper look at Ethereum to see if there was a connection. But nothing else is even close. Nothing else is even close. Now, flip over to the next slide, if you will, Gary. I went to Google Trends next, and I punched in the names of our top ten alt, of our top ten coins to find out what the trend was in mentions in Google search volume. Now, if you look over on the right side, start with the stuff I typed over there on the right. It said the following had too little interest to even chart. Peercoin, BitShares, Namecoin, MadeSafe coins. They don't even show up. Period. Nothing. And unfortunately, Monero, NXT, Ripple, and Stellar are too ambiguous to get good chart data for, them, right? Because NXT is also some WWE event. Okay, <laughs> who would have known? Ripple, well, you know, Stellar, you know, and Monero. It turns out there's like a soap opera star named like Antonio Monero oh, or something. God. So it totally screws it up. <laughs> and he doesn't do cryptocurrency. <laughs> he doesn't seem to do cryptocurrency. <laughs> I don't think the coin's named after him. <laughs> Anyway, so what do we have actually good data for? Litecoin, Ethereum, and Dogecoin. Litecoin is the red one. Notice the big light, the, the, sorry, Ethereum is the red one. Notice the big spike in the red line. That was Microsoft mentioning that they were going to build something on top of Ethereum. That's what drove the Ethereum volume. But if you look at that, you see there's no real correlation between what's happened with Bitcoin right over at the end of that chart. Okay, yeah, there's a, they're, they're up a little bit, but nothing meaningful. Now, here's what's really scary. Go to the next chart. This is what happens to that whole chart when you add in Bitcoin. These are the relative interest levels, guys. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So this is, this is like, uh, <laughs> this is like Ripple and... That's Litecoin, Ethereum, and Dogecoin down there, those other three colored bars. And this is Bitcoin. Merge into that little chocolate bar at the bottom of the screen. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's really no, there's no surprise there. Well, I would have thought that there would have been you know, some knock-on effect in interest levels.
levels. This was the assumption that I went in with. But the conclusion of all this is very simple. It's it's a one horse show, and this rally has been totally a one horse show. Uh, it's all about Bitcoin. No one else has picked up a real bump off of it. Uh, no one seems to be riding the coattails, as it were. So our answer, you know, who's been riding the coattails and who's set out this rally? Well, it's it's a Bitcoin rally, pure and simply a Bitcoin rally. And I think largely from the discussions we've had in the previous week, I haven't seen anything to contradict that this week, uh, driven by the China market. And the China market's interested in Bitcoin. You know, what's interesting about that is uh, the, the Bitcoin market cap is, what, a little bit over $5 billion now? Five and a half. Five and a half. And it also moved in larger in terms of a percentage basis. So you, you can see, it, you know, with a, another coin like Ethereum, for example, it's worth, I don't know, 50 or 60 million, whereas Bitcoin is over 5 billion. And so to, to move the price around percentage wise on one of those smaller coins take a, takes a lot less money. Uh, you're talking about billions of dollars in, um, in uh, changes, uh, or at least hundreds of millions when, it, when you're talking about Bitcoin. So it's, it's interesting. It's just, it really is the 800 million gorilla. <laughs> Someone needs to say <laughs> Believe me, I am one of the guys. There was one interesting thing that, that, that came out of this whole bit of research. One correlation. Perhaps there's a causation there, but there was clearly a correlation. There was a massive spike in ripple velocity that coincided with the Bitcoin spike, which said to me a number of people were using ripple as an intermediary currency to get in and out of Bitcoin. Which seemed very interesting, which makes you wonder if uh, you know Ripple isn't starting to serve that intermediary currency function that they've set out to serve. Right? They wanted to become the new intermediary currency that enables transactions between coins, between fiat and coins, etc. But uh, Ripple saw a huge volume spike on the day of the Bitcoin spike, mm. and that's all I have on that. So, conclusion: it's a one-horse race. Yeah. All right. Moving right along. Um, so uh, one of the things Rick mentioned was the uh, large Bitcoin transactions in the last 24 hours. Uh, because Bitcoin is on a public ledger, you can see everything that happens. And uh, so I pulled up a kind of a, well, this is kind of a famous transaction. Check this out. 26,000 Bitcoin. Who's moving 26,000 Bitcoin in the last 24 hours? Anybody uh, have any ideas? Is it you? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I had to top up my, my uh, web wallet because I'm going to go to Kismet after this. So uh, drinks are on me. Pulsa, Pulsa, the lifetime of Pulsa. Nine million dollars. I'll go with Johnny. Million dollars. Nine million dollars. Yes. Um, yes, this was uh, th this was the um, the Silk Road bitcoins. These are the the um, Fed who auctioned off the bitcoins, and now they're sending those bitcoins to some uh, some new owner. So That's the US right. U.S. Marshal Service. In other words. <laughs> yes. That's who it was. That's who it did the seizure. It went, it went to we don't know where. Oh, wait a second. I I was just going to pick that out as my thought. <laughs> when did this happen? This happened on the night. Yep, yeah, it happened about 15 or 16 hours ago. Right, okay. I'm completely out of my notes then. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we're uh, a. <laughs> yeah, one thing that's interesting about this is um, it went to a an address that begins with a one. So uh, that is an, an address that has just one private key. Um, so if, if someone knew, if anyone in this room knew the private key associated with this address, they could uh, have these 26,000 Bitcoins. Um, just a single number that out, lives out there in the world, there's some number that would allow you to, uh, to take these Bitcoins and uh, it's just one. So what's interesting about that is um, the change went to an address that starts with a three. You ever seen a Bitcoin address that begins with a three? I don't know what you're talking about. Um, well, a Bitcoin address that starts with a three is um, a, um, 
a multi-signature address, meaning that um, this amount, about 3.7 million, after, after they sent the $9 million to this address, the change went back to this address that begins with a three, which is a, a multi-signature multi address, which means that various parties have to sign it in order to move that money around. So it's much safer, especially when you're talking about huge amounts like this. It's kind of interesting that they only sent it, they sent it to a, an address with just a single key. Because if that key gets compromised, then it's game over. Uh, it's much, much better practice to send to a multi-sig address uh, and, and give the, the keys to multiple parties so that uh, um, you've got some accountability. So. Surely there's going to be some clarity around this transaction. Well, the Fed's going to come decide where it went. Well, the, yeah. The, well, the Fed, the Fed took real money. Well, fiat money in exchange for these bitcoins, so they know exactly who they're dealing with. Yeah, but like, is it? It's going to be announced, isn't it? Like that? Uh, uh, probably not. But it probably was the subject of a tender. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. They they have a whole process, and the the process is is uh, transparent. But I don't know if it's common knowledge where the the bitcoins went. I heard that Itbit uh, bought a bunch. But uh, I think I saw that on one of the headlines, but I'm not sure. Sure, they're going to announce price and everything. Otherwise, it's just very opaque. Well, the, the reason they do it, the reason they do it with an auction is so that the um, the price can be um, agreed on without affecting the markets at large. Because when you're putting 26 million dollars into the, you know, if you, try, if you yeah, if you try to do that on the on the market, then you push the price around tremendously. So they they do it that way in order to not affect the price. Yeah. And I don't know if they published the actual price that they were sold for. I'm not sure. We're going, we're sure. Have going, we don't agree with the price. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they could just sell it to all their mates for 200 bucks a pop. They could release something. Yeah, it was five or 10 minutes. Yeah, it was five or 10 minutes. So yeah, it's confidential. But I like the way you think. <laughs> you, can, you can make a good politician. Sammy said it already happened with the silk. Investigate that. Investigate that silk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Just don't think of the cops yet. Uh, it's kind of a moral story. The larger the, the number of bitcoins being transferred doesn't affect the block size, right? It doesn't. No, the, the transact. Well, it depends. A, a multi sig transaction is longer than a, a single. Um, right. So it's a little bit bigger in terms of just the bytes that make up the transaction mm -hmm. but yeah n nothing significant mm -hmm. and uh, what's interesting is uh, you can actually see the the fees that are associated with a particular transaction mm -hmm. six cents six cents, six cents to trans Bye. transfer Bye. yeah Eat that, Western Union. <laughs> pretty neat huh <laughs> <laughs> All right. So speaking of uh, famous uh, Bitcoin and uh, you know the transparent ledger, uh, we've got Roger Ver. You guys heard of Roger Ver? He's like the Bitcoin Jesus. He's like a you know he's kind of a high profile guy when it comes to Bitcoin. And uh, well, let me just play a little bit of this for you. So some jerks tried to extort me for twenty Bitcoins. Or he's going to have the SWAT team sent to my mother's house and he's threatening to put crack in her food. Uh, he just contacted me on Skype a few minutes ago. No idea who he is. He's got this he hacker on Skype. See what happens. <laughs> he's calling his hacker. <laughs> so anyway, uh, I'll just fast forward here. Yeah, I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is I'm going to upload this video to YouTube and let everybody see who you are. And I'm going to post a 20 Bitcoin bounty to have you caught and arrested. And I hope they lock you in jail for a long, long time. Are you the same guy that sent the SWAT team to uh, Hal Finney? <laughs> so anyway, this is, uh, I love this kind of stuff. You know I do. It's like the soap opera. Um, but, I, but it's really actually fascinating because here's what's going on. You've got fam famous Roger Ver. He's famous in the Bitcoin circles. Everybody knows that he's got a lot of Bitcoin. And so some crazy person from somewhere around the world just decides to commandeer his, um, or you know, basically track down his Skype contact information and threaten him, extort him for, for 20 Bitcoins. And uh, it's interesting what Roger Ver does to respond because it's, there's no, like, imagine calling up your local police and saying there's some 
Russian hacker trying to extort me for 20 bitcoins. Like you just, like you, you, I don't, I don't <coughs> think you'd get much, <laughs> much traction there. So, so what he does is he appeals to the, the masses, right? He makes a, a YouTube video and he, he uses this thing called the uh, Bitcoin bounty hunter. <laughs> so, and the guy was asking for 20 bitcoins. So what he did was he turned around and he sent 20 bitcoins to this uh, Bitcoin bounty hunter. And because it's Bitcoin, this is like a, a use case for cryptocurrency that you can't achieve with, with something else, right? He's, he's send, sending this 20 bitcoins, this um, so Bitcoin bounty hunter in an, as an escrow, in an escrow situation, right? So he's now proven that he's got 20 bitcoins, which is worth how much? That's like, how much is that? Like five, six grand, $6,000. So if somebody is like a white hat hacker and wants that 20 bitcoins, he can go out and figure out who this guy is and um, and claim this 20 bitcoins. But how how does it work? Like, it's, it's very interesting. So um, basically, Roger Ver created this uh, bounty on the Bitcoin bounty hunter site. He actually sent his bitcoins to this um, to this site, but it goes into a multi-sig transaction into an escrow type situation. So if nothing ever happens, if the guy is never caught, the bitcoins can come back to him. But if someone takes a look at the the account and um, decides they they want to solve it, um, they can come to this site called Proof of Existence and basically. Uh, document the fact that he's figured out who this guy is by creating a document and then um, you can drag and drop it onto this site and it will create a Bitcoin transaction on the blockchain with the hash of all the information that he's got on this guy that he's caught. So he can prove that he has all the information that, that it takes to catch this guy. Then he takes that information to the local authorities and presents the case and if this guy gets arrested by the local police in his area based on the, the information that's gathered, then uh, this Bitcoin bounty hunter site will then, because the guy can prove that he had the information that led to his arrest. So it's, you know, a lot of, a lot of times, you know, I'm kind of a libertarian and one of the things that people argue with me about with libertarians is, well, how are you going to have the police? Like who's going to be the police if you, you have like, uh, you know, if everybody's just free to do whatever they want and, and, uh, it's interesting that in this case you kind of have like a like a an outsourced detective agency. You can pay for your own justice or your own. Uh, it's vigilantes. Well, it's 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 not quite vigilantes because he's not like um, showing. <laughs> he's not showing up um, to you know to arrest the guy. They're using the the regular police for that. But so this is what crowdsourced police. Yes. And by the way, uh, this happened one other time to Roger Ver, and he did exactly the same thing. And uh, he got like at, at that point in time, they had commandeered like his email and his, all these other things. And uh, the the as soon as he put the bounty out, the guy returned all of his login information, and it was uh, resolved. So, I mean, it's super cool that he can put his evidence out there and time stamp it. Like that, mm -hmm. I really like that aspect. It's kind of frightening, you know, just bouncing on this stuff. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that could get that's why I'm saying vigilante. It's kind of like well, Rogers taking that role. Well, it's um, it is interesting. In this case, there's not like you're not saying, "Hey, somebody go kill this guy, and I'll give you twenty bitcoin." It's like just to set, just make the case. It's really not. <laughs> just change the language of it. Pretty good point. This assassination. And then you know, if you got spin doctors on it, you might have trouble. Well, the I mean, it's the the harder part is figuring out who the guy is in an unequivocal way. And that's really what he's paying for. I mean, you could go and, and have somebody murdered for hire, and you wouldn't, wouldn't want to go anywhere near Bitcoin to, to do that. So, I mean, I don't know. I'm not sure if this introduces some new use case for, <laughs> you know, vigilante justice. <laughs> I don't know. What do you guys think? Do you think this is like a, a worrisome development or a good thing? 
what sort of other things are there bounties for on the side? We just have a curiosity. Uh, let's see. It, it could create, like, what about if law enforcement went rogue? So rather than do law enforcement doing their job and getting paid as their job. You mean like go rogue to collect the bounty? You mean like it happens in Thailand? <laughs> yeah, like it happens. In, like, yeah, like we have mercenaries everywhere. Well, I mean, people have talked about this concept before, right? like an assassination market. And it does, I think, provide extra opportunities because you can do it. I mean, previously, you have to interact with the person. Now, you don't even have, you don't have to know who the assassin was. You just, if the assassin says, okay, on this day, I will kill Obama, for example. And then what happens, and you just send he, when before he, he predicted the event before him, and when he gets the Bitcoin after the event, because he predicted it correctly. And uh, but, but you can see who pay, who made that payment, right? If that if that bounty is public knowledge, you can see who received the But you can't because it's anonymous, it's a Bitcoin address. How do you yeah. know who received it? Well you, you but the thing is you can tell who paid for it. But how? It's a Bitcoin transaction. Well, how are you communicating with the person when you're saying uh, he's going to be dead on this date? Is it just up on a board somewhere? Or? Well, you can't be, I think there are no less communication. You can, yeah. you can, you can use whatever you want. Is that all there is? All the bounties? Uh, yeah. Looks like it. So what's going on? What's going on? <laughs> so. Help catch whoever's responsible for the theft of tens of thousands of Bitcoin from Bitcoinica. Basically, a bunch of uh, well, here's the DDoS. A good Tomlin sells a very good head, like make a killing with Bitcoin. I like, I like the eight hundred and three dollar bounty for salting the entire Mt. Gox situation. <laughs> I, know, I know, wasn't that like eight hundred million dollars at the yeah, time or exactly. something? <laughs> I think I think whoever's responsible will just turn himself in and get that eight hundred dollars. Exactly. Well, actually, Roger's willing to pay fourteen grand there. This is another one. Oh. Yeah. All right. Oh, we're on that. Did you guys want to do an assassination market? No. An assassination market is a prediction market where any party can place a bet using anonymous money and pseudo anonymous remailers on the date of the death of a given individual and collect a fire of the guess the date accurately. So if you can guess the date accurately, you must have been. Actually, I think with a party, I would say it exists in Ben Penarchy as the highest price for. Like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that's that's yeah, actually one of. I hope it's a parody site and nothing so, more. That could be like the worst PR ever uh, if that were ever to happen. Um, yeah, perish the thought. All right. Speaking of uh, the the Fed, did you guys see this in the New York Times? Um, strong growth in jobs may encourage Fed to raise rates. Um, really fascinating. After this jobs report came out, um, basically two hundred seventy-one thousand uh, new jobs. Uh, I think the unemployment rate has dropped below five percent. And Janet Yellen came out with some sort of uh, um, state statement saying that it's possible they may raise rates in December. Now, if you remember, the the last time they were talking about raising rates was in September, and that's when the rupiah went up over fourteen thousand rupiah per dollar, yeah. because uh, essentially. Uh, if this move happens, it will strengthen the, the dollar versus other currencies, um, and you know hurt U.S. exports and have all kinds of uh, knock-on effects. But uh, it's interesting that they're they're now, you know, they they got a lot of criticism after not raising the rates in September, because you know these these rates have been near zero for for seven years, and they haven't raised rates for nine years. So this is. Uh, a highly unusual circumstance. The, the world has never seen interest rates at zero for this period of time. 
it essentially changes the price of everything, causes uh, asset bubbles. Um, this this has all kinds of unintended consequences, and I don't think the Fed knows what's really going to happen when they begin to raise rates, and uh, so they talk about it because talking about the possibility tends to uh, make people happy, but we'll see what happens when it when and if it actually happens in December. That's what they're talking about. Uh, now, what's interesting is you know they're they're citing the, the the jobs numbers as a reason to, to that it, that the economy is showing strength. Um, the the unemployment rate has gone below five percent. Um, but what's interesting is the way that they calculate the unemployment rate. Um, basically, if you if you've been on unemployment for too long, they just stop counting you altogether. Right. And uh, what's interesting here is this is this is not the unemployment rate. This is the labor participation rate, and this is a very long sequence here, back to the 1950s. And uh, you can see back in the 50s, you know, you had uh, wives staying at home, right? And then uh, women kind of entered the workforce in the in the 70s. And um, well, if you look over here, this is when we had the recession in 2008, and look at what has happened to the labor participation rate. Um, since the since the recession, it is seems to be in a nosedive, and we are now at a labor participation rate that is about the same as 1977. So, you know, it's not part of the Fed's mandate to affect the labor participation rate. It's their mandate to uh, affect the unemployment rate. And if people drop off the unemployment rolls, it can drop off. If someone goes in, you know, if there's a lawyer who go, goes to get a job at Burger King because he can't find a job as a lawyer, that counts as an employed person. It's referred to as underemployment, but it counts as employment. Um, and uh, so it's it's interesting that these 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 numbers are, um, I don't know. It's supposed to reflect a, an economy that's recovering, you know, and that's why they they shoot for the unemployment rate that they shoot for. But if you look at other numbers, I think it's safe to say that um, well, things aren't th things aren't all rosy. So how do they calculate this? Like the trend is undeniable, but the way we work is changed. Like the way we work is changed. Well. So is this being picked up? Uh, is this chart being calculated on who's paying tax on their income? So it's picking up all the you know the people with their Etsy shops or their Amazon. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is this. I think that they get this is from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and I think that they do get their figures from the large tax pay, tax paying um, corporations that have large uh, payrolls. Right. So if these people, um, you know, got fired from their corporate job and then moved to Bali, and you know making money as a social media expert and not reporting their, you know, showing up as not participating in the labor force, then I don't know. I don't know if that could account for like this kind of drop. I mean, this is millions of people. I was thinking if that person is sitting here in Hubbard and paying their taxes back in the US, would they be counted? Yeah, I think they would be counted. I do believe they would be counted, yes, because they're, you know, if they're paying their taxes, then the Bureau of Labor Statistics will have that information. Who do you think saved the demographics? The value boom is putting into retirement dollars. True. It'll be interesting to see if that's coincided as well to kind of skew that down. That's a good point. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. Something like thousands of baby boomers retire every day or something. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It's a big one. The other thing, like, I don't know mm -hmm. about any changes to the way they calculate this data, but I'm pretty sure in the UK they changed the way they um, calculate GDP. Yeah. They started including the black code. Well, you know, GDP is such an awful number to to drive any kind of policy because there's so many awful things that show up in GDP numbers. I mean, uh, tobacco sales. Um, you know, if there was an earthquake and they needed to spend all that money to rebuild, that would all show up in in GDP when it, you know. All you're doing is getting back to where you were before the earthquake. Um, right, it's not add, adding anything. And it doesn't necessarily mean anyone's happier or more well off. You know?
know, uh, if someone someone goes to the hospital and they have a hundred thousand dollar hospital bill. That's GDP, baby. You know, it's not necessarily a good thing, especially for that person. So uh, we're not GDH yet. Yeah. Anyway, interesting. All right, on to happier news. Check it out. This guy, uh, Bhagawan Chowdhury, he's not a not a crazy person. He's a professor of finance at UCLA Anderson School, uh, and he has nominated Satoshi Nakamoto for the Nobel Prize in Economics. Uh, oh, we got a little break going by. It's a musical interlude. <laughs> Um, anyway, he, he basically wrote this in the Huffington Post. I'll put the link in the show notes. Um, he's, he's proposing to, well, he's, he's suggesting that uh, Satoshi Nakamoto should be nominated. And um, he's also saying that he could accept the, the prize on his behalf. And also Satoshi Nakamoto could make his Bitcoin address uh, known through by signing a message because we know what his... Um, PGP key is he could actually sign a message so that we know he's communicating with us and he could provide a Bitcoin address and a signed message from his um, public PGP key and he could actually take delivery of the prize um, so it's kind of a, a funny story I I can pretty safely say that he will not win the prize um, for one thing I think uh, you have to be alive in order to get a, a Nobel Prize. They don't or they don't award these things posthumously, and uh, I don't know how we prove that Satoshi Nakamoto is alive. We're not the Nobel Peace Prize. I don't think it's possible. <laughs> yes. <That's right>. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? But he's alive and he's not an AI. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> and the fact that Obama got the Nobel Peace Prize is proof enough yeah. that he'll never get the Nobel Prize. <laughs> well, you know what's interesting is. Uh, small note, the, the Nobel Prize in Economics was not something originally set up as a Nobel Prize. It's the no Alfred Nobel Honorary Prize in Economics. It's not the same as the Peace Prize and the Prize for Literature and, and everything else. So just trivia, some little trivia for you there. All right. Remember this guy? Yanis Varoufakis, the, the former Greek finance minister. Back in the headlines at the Guardian because they've. Um, this is a kind of a weird story. You posted this one, Deborah, and I agree with you. I would go. This is a. <laughs> this is. <laughs> right, right. Well, I think what's really. In, I mean, they're making the point that this whole thing seems to have uh, blown over when really this thing. I just don't understand why. The entire planet isn't just jumping up and down with their hair on fire about what what has happened in Greece. You know, th this is a story about a bunch of comedians getting together with these economists and like poking fun, which I think is sometimes an effective way to communicate just how ridiculous certain things are. But um, Varoufakis wasn't able to stay around for the the meat of the conference, the four day thing, and the problems in Greece persist. I mean, just to refresh your memory, they they really could not pay their debts, and they've been living under austerity since I think 2008. They uh, elected a party that ran on the platform of reducing austerity, so they voted these guys into office, and then um, the central bank said that we're going to cut off all your funding, and you know the the um, Shiraz government, the government in Greece, went to the people and had a vote. We want to um, basically engage in these um, bailout loans and and more austerity, or do we want to um, default on our on our loans? And they voted to yes, default on the loans, and then Shiraz proceeded to make the agreement, an agreement that was worse than the one they held a referendum on. So democracy is totally a farce. They I mean, I don't know. They had elections since then. They, they had a referendum election of his party, and he was re-elected. Yes. This guy, however, is not still involved, <laughs> from what I can tell. Oh, yeah. 
But I think it's I think it's interesting. I just find it just crazy that you know there's a bunch of people living in Greece. They're going about their business. You know, they're working their jobs. A lot of them work for the state. They have state pensions, and uh, they're just living their life. And the the government that, that they've elected is just making all these crazy deals, uh, borrowing all this money. Um, you know, indenturing like future generations with all of this debt. And uh, when they try and vote to change things, the, the people just ignore it. And then they, they increase the austerity. And these people are like, I, the way I see it, they're, they're like slaves to the government that made uh, agreements on their behalf, basically sold them up the river. I mean, these people that worked their whole lives and are counting on a pension, they're not going to get it. Like, they're not going to be able to eat. <laughs> uh, it's just... Uh, it's, it's amazing to me. I really think that it's related to a government monopoly on money because, you know, when this thing was all going on, you know, all of a sudden their money was not available to them. They couldn't go to the, you know, the banks were closed. They couldn't get rid of the ATM. They couldn't pay their international suppliers if you had a business. And they had no alternative, right? Yeah, I mean, they, they, the monopoly money system broke, and they had no alternate money system to try and be human beings on planet Earth with, you know. Um, for many, the Chinese outsourced their money to Macau and got it out, right? Uh, I don't know. What, what, yeah, what's that, that one? What we were talking about, the spike was? There was certainly a lot of buying. Whether it went out is a different question. Yeah. Right? I mean, but it went out of the banks. I mean, they couldn't yeah. take, they could not take more than $3,000 out, right? And then, so they just sent it to Macau and got it out. That was a workaround, which the Greeks didn't have that option. <coughs> that was last week, right? What was the $3,000? Uh, I'm not sure. Are you talking about somebody else, like the Chinese doing something? Yeah, the Chinese, the Chinese, I read, maybe I read this somewhere, that the, that the Chinese, uh, that one of the speculative reasons for the spike, and we had a very, very big one, um, was that a whole bunch of, uh, the, the Chinese put um, the same kind of controls on withdrawals. And uh, so many people just went to go gamble in Macau and Bitcoined their money and picked it up over there. Mm -hmm. So they could get it out of the bank that way. But they could not go and withdraw any more than, than well, than you know, well, you know what's interesting about that is, well, for one thing, China has been participating in the Bitcoin market for well over a year. So there's a lot of Bitcoin in China, uh -huh. and China did uh, um, lower their their interest rate. Uh, they devalue their currency, and they did implement more capital controls. Yes. And that was the speculate part of what what fueled the speculative boom that raised prices recently. Um, and what's interesting is they, if you compare and contrast, the Chinese do have an alternative mechanism because they've gotten into Bitcoin. They have, you know, if everything freezes up in terms of renminbi, whoever's got Bitcoin in China has still got a way to move, yeah. right. They've got a way to move money internationally and, uh, um, and basically pay people they need to pay. Um, you know, it, it's, uh, I think it's a community resilience thing to, to have some sort of alternate mechanism to transact with, with people. You gotta, you, know? you gotta prime that pump before the, you know, the stuff goes down, right? Right. Yeah. right. Um, anyway, I'll see if I can chase that where I found that, because I remember reading that. Okay. Wondering what was driving such a sudden spike. Yeah. Right, right. All right. This was a... Um, a story posted by Stephen DeMillionaire. Um, essentially, th this is a, a story written by this guy who works for the French government. Um, when it comes to compensation, the company you work for often matters more than how, um, how good you are at what you do. In 2013, the average employee of Goldman Sachs, the investment bank, earned $383,000, much higher than what the best performing employee at most firms can hope to take home. So. That's massively skewed, though, because the CEO takes home off, yeah. Yeah, right. yeah. Well, and, but what's interesting about this story is the point that he's making is that government should get involved when people in certain industries make way more than people in other industries. There, 
they're saying that, and I've, I've heard this indictment of Wall Street where all the rocket scientists are not going to work for NASA or SpaceX. They're going to work for Wall Street because they can make way more money on Wall Street than, than they can in the engineering sciences that they studied. Right. Um, but this is pretty, this is kind of a, a French socialist uh, um, idea to fixing this kind of problem is you basically create a bunch of rules that say, you know, if you're in this industry, you can only pay your employees this much and, you know, we can, we should try and redistribute the money that's paid to people who go into certain industries. And I don't know if Stephen posted this because he likes this idea or uh, it's certainly not something I would get behind because... I feel like whenever government gets involved and tries to decide what the what the price of anything is, or try to decide who gets paid what, I mean, there's inevitably consequences that you don't intend, right? And uh, yeah, I don't think that this is a uh, this this should be the case. And I think the reason that financial services employees make so much more than other industries is because of all the shenanigans that go go around with creating money out of thin air. Um, and you know the, their ability to siphon money into their industry from all the productive members of society. So you can attack that problem, try and create more of a, a, a fair money system, which is why we get together every Tuesday night, talk about this stuff. But going in and saying, oh, well, you make too much and you make too little, so we're going to take a little from you and give it to you. And oh, you, sh you definitely shouldn't make uh, over $100,000 or something along those lines. Um, you know. But uh, one, one thing that was interesting about this idea that he had was to create uh, um, a token, or to create basically this uh, um, token that you earn over the course of a lifetime that uh, um, uh, uh, entitles you to all kinds of state benefits, you know, and you get this token just by virtue of being an employee, and uh, the token would be redeemable for higher education or, you know, maternity leave or um, all these things that you know, essentially end up being paid for by other people. Um, but it is kind of interesting that they want to use a token. That was something that was uh, quite novel, I thought. I wish Stephen were here. He could, he could tell us what he thought was interesting. And the metric, isn't that, what's, how is that different to paying a tax and getting, you know, your undergraduate education free or getting your health care free? You know, you paid the tax, you contributed to these baseline services in your economy, roads, whatever. Yeah, I think I think the only novel thing is the use of this this token or like, you know, frequent flyer miles for, for government benefits kind of thing. I would be really interested if I could then decide how I wanted my government to spend my contribution. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, 80% okay. on infrastructure, thank you very much. Well, yeah, no, we've talked about that in the past. In fact, it's uh, it's quite interesting that you know you can pay 30, 30 or forty, upwards of fifty percent of your income in taxes, and they can go and do things that are, you know, awful things: extraordinary rendition, um, torture, uh, drone attacks. They just bombed a hospital recently, which is an awful story. Um, and to think that. You know, they paid for some of that with, you know, money. Like yeah, with with my human effort, um, it's it's enough to make you feel. And without little, my permission. Right. Yeah. It'd be nice if you could if you could tell them where to spend the money that you contribute. That's what I mean. Yeah. It's like we we really see what people want. <laughs> you're you're represented by your elected officials. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Didn't you call your congressman? Tell them, go, you I'm against bombing hospitals. <laughs> Oh, sorry. We won't do it next time. Um, just hope they spell your just hope they spell your name right on the form letter that you get in response. Um, okay, so we posted this. This got quite a, a lot of uh, interesting attention. Um, this is uh, <laughs> this guy wrote a blog post back in 1995, poo pooing the internet as a fad. Uh, the internet question mark. Wow. And uh, here, here's some of the things that he thought were ridiculous. Vision telecommuting workers. That's crazy, isn't it? Interactive libraries, multimedia classrooms. They speak of electronic town meetings and virtual communities. Commerce and business walls to networks and modems and the freedom of governments. 
baloney. <laughs> um, the truth is, in no 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 online uh, database will replace your daily newspaper. No CD-ROM can take the player, and no computer network will change the way government work. Governments work. So anyway, he kind of uh, eats his hat here at the bottom. Says, "Yep, I got it wrong," um, and it's kind of interesting. And uh, I think it's really interesting. News posted. I love that. Have nothing here, guys. Just say what it was. <laughs> and the head of J.P. Morgan, Lagarde, basically saying this. Oh. Actually, even last week, what's with that? Uh, well, what I thought was interesting, and you can see Jamie Diamond. Uh, the, the thing that's really interesting about his retort, he, first of all, he says Bitcoin um, be, will always be the dollar. And he said, and the Department of Justice, when they say it's illegal and they come and arrest you, then we'll see how well Bitcoin is worked. Uh, I thought it was quite a commentary on his uh, hubris to presume that he can speak for what the Department of Justice is going to go in and and well, we it was, it's, a, checks, yeah. it's a it's a rare glimpse into, into the, the into the system right he's into he's yeah he's like you know he he basically guarantees that bitcoin will not work and essentially that the the department of justice could uh, declare it illegal and they could go arrest everybody involved um that's not america though True, true. I, and, you know, I, it, he goes on to say some things about Bitcoin itself that shows that he, he really knows very little about it. Um, and I think he does have a, a U.S. centric view. Um, but it was uh, it was quite interesting that that he and Lagarde, Christine Lagarde, who runs the IMF, um, were so adamant in the negative about Bitcoin. It's kind of exciting, right? You can judge a man by his enemies kind of thing or what's that Gandhi quote you know first they ignore you then they fight you then or they laugh at you and then you win or something like that when they fight you, then you win. yeah so they're fighting us I guess the next step is we win so anyway we are uh, we are at the hour a little bit over so I think we have to leave it at that <clears throat> note um, don't forget we've got uh, startup weekend two weeks from now um, this weekend, we've got Bit go to Bitcoins in Bali slash Bitcoin 101 and register there. And uh, um, we'll, we'll do this again next Tuesday night, uh, same time, same station. See you then. Same <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs>